Okay, so hi everybody. I'm Michael. I'm head of research at Chorus One. We are a staking provider with now more than $3 billion in stake. And I want to talk about timing games today. Um, I'm presenting a paper which we wrote earlier in the year. It's called The Cost of Artificial Latency in the PBS Context. And it's basically about what happens when validators delay bids. Um, let's take a quick look at the agenda. So three major points. I want to start by defining what timing games are, why validators would pay, play timing games, and what upside, so what financial upside validators could capture by delaying bid selection in a timing games context. I'll then talk about uh, negative externalities that might arise from timing games. Um, I think there's three major categories here, and we'll take some time to walk through all of them. And then lastly, I'll talk a little bit about our timing games pilot. So we, we take an accelerationist uh, point of view here. And uh, we, we've been uh, kind of testing out timing games since the summer. But for us, it was important to balance rational competition with, uh, with ecosystem alignment. And for that reason, the, the study that I'll present today basically open sources all of our parameters and uh, kind of makes it uh, yeah, open for, for other people to, to look into and to uh, potentially imitate if, if that's what uh, somebody is looking to do. Um, yeah, so why play timing games? There is a certain dynamic, which is as the slot progresses, more transactions hit builders. Um, so they have a larger pool of transactions which they can use to build an optimal block. And secondly, statistical arbitrageurs are able to quote wider and more aggressively, right? So if you were to arbitrage, let's say, Uniswap against Binance, and you were to do that at the beginning of the block, you would have to be reasonably more confident about what you think the price is going to be by the time your arbitrage settles than you would have to be if you would uh, execute this arbitrage closer to the end of, uh, of the slot. And what that means, the upshot of that is that blocks become more valuable in expectation due to basically transactions and by proxy MEV accruing at the builders. And the, the graph that you can see on the right side here is when validators usually um, select uh, the, the next block. And in the next slides, we'll look at you know, what, that, what that would look like in a timing game context. So let's set the stage here by putting a number on the upside. If a validator were to um, delay its bid selection to uh, 950 milliseconds in the slot, uh, this will, and we will assume that uh, execution layer rewards are approximately 30% of all rewards, that basically uh, means a, a APR upside of 1.67% in expectation. And what that means is, uh, you know, it's starting to get quite significant and people would be incentivized to, to do something like that. Um, this could reflect in different ways, depending on how big you are as a node operator. If you're a large node operator and you kind of pull your rewards across different clients, so let's say you have 13% of the voting power, which really would make you a very large node operator, then kind of the, the volatility that is inherent to MEV, it would smooth out a little bit. And you would have a pretty good idea of what you could earn by playing timing games. Whereas if you're a small validator, MEV reward, as I mentioned, are very volatile, you would be situated at a different point of the risk reward curves. What would happen is, uh, is uh, that your rewards would, would vary a lot more. Um, this is both a way of you know, kind of reflecting the law of large numbers, which means if you run either a lot of validators or you run them for a long time, you would be approximately uh, aiming, you would be approximately looking at the same result in expectation, right? Um, one thing we argue in the paper is that this theoretical assumption is actually not reflected in practice. And the reason for that is that timing games impose several negative externalities, which disproportionately hit small validators. And with that said, let's go to the next section and talk about these three big categories of negative externalities. Um, the, the first point here is excess burned ETH. Basically, the dynamic that underpins that is as the auction progresses, the, the gas price in expectation rises, 
this reflects on the next slot, which means that the ETH burned in the slots that are subsequent to a timing game slot would be higher than you would expect it to be without the timing game type dynamic in play. Um, and the upshot of that again is that it's a, it's a negative externality which disproportionately hits small validators because it puts them on a worse point on the risk reward curve. The, these things don't really smooth out um, as, as quickly. Um, and, uh, and yeah, uh, so there's two consequences of that. It basically cuts into the profits of the next proposer. And the upshot of that is a zero sum game. So if everybody plays Kaiman games, what happens is uh, that uh, the, uh, the slot basically just shifts backwards in a way everybody would be, would be cutting into everybody else's profit and at the end of the day you would just be redistributing the pie. But if you're really small and you, you, can't, you can't compete because of resource constraints that we'll go into later or because you're very aligned and you, you, uh, you don't want to play time in games, you're basically subsidizing people that, uh, that uh, feel, feel a bit more liberal about that. Um, yeah, and for excess Eve burn, the median increase for the slot subsequent to a timing game slot. And again, here in the theoretical part of things, we assume that somebody playing timing games means that the get header request gets delayed to 950 milliseconds in the slot, just to recap that. The median increase of burned Eve works out at 0.4% in expectation, which, which is uh, reasonably large, and, and that's the reason why we, we wanted to address that as, as a negative externality, which is uh, in expectation quite significant. Um, let's go to the next negative externality, which is basically based on the same dynamic. Um, as you delay your get header request, as you play time in games as a validator, um, the amount of transactions that might accrue to your slot, they uh, increase in expectation. And another way of saying that is transactions that may have been included in subsequent slots actually land in the current one, which, which is the slot that would be affected by timing games. So again, this is another way of describing the zero-sum dynamic. And it's just to say that you know, if you don't engage in timing games, um, it's, going to, it's going to decrease the rewards that you can expect as, as a validator. Um, so let's, let's recap that by, by, um, by specifically naming what the upshot of that would be, right? Um, it's an increase in centralization pressure. Um, large operators in a timing, node operators in a timing game context benefit from comparatively higher APR at lower variance. And small operators on the other side of things are disproportionately increased to variance from the long tail of bad externalities. Uh, let me just recap the Eve burn example here. And secondly, small node operators might not even be able to um, engage in timing games at the, at the same amount of, uh, of uh, expected utility in the first place. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is lack of internal data. If you're a big node operator and you, you have a ton of validators, you, you have a way of getting uh, to... Um, of just accruing more data and, and forming a strong opinion of what an appro appropriate latency parameter would be. Whereas if you're a small validator, it just takes you a really long time to, to you know, kind of find out how, how you can play time in games efficiently. And, and if something changes, if a relay were to start behaving differently, for example, it would take you a disproportionately longer time to change your opinion than, uh, than a large node operator would have, right? So, so there is a big centralization factor here. And then something which kind of comes in tandem with that is just the fact that large node operators are typically better capitalized, so, so you, can, you can have people spend time on, on this stuff, right? Um, the, yeah, and the risk here is, is basically centralization on the one hand, and then on the second hand, the, on the second, uh, um, uh, secondly, this, uh, this risk manifests as a self-reinforcing cycle. Because if you, if you don't play pay time in games at all, you're again disproportionately exposed. So node operators are compelled to, to employ latency optimization, play time in games as a matter of strategic necessity. 
Okay. Um, with that said, let's let's look at what our approach has been here. Um, in the summer, we started summer of 23. We started to play around with with a timing game setup. Um, we named that Adagio. My co-author on the paper is is Italian, and in Italian. Uh, if you if you were to play a musical piece, adagio, it, it would mean that it's performed slowly and and with great um, expression. So so we kind of named it adagio as a as a nod to just going about uh, calling get header slowly in a in a very thoughtful uh, manner. Yeah, and so. This has not been a client-facing product for us, but more of an internal research initiative that that ran on on our own um, our own validators. Now, as soon as we as we kind of came to conclusions there, which which seemed uh, statistically significant for us, we did two things. On the one hand, we we outsourced our data and we outsourced our initial parameters. So again, this is the study I'm presenting today, and if you're interested in this, find the study. Um, it's, um, it's on our website, chorus.1. And then secondly, we kind of acknowledge that the timing games were something that you know, would just happen with the way PBS is currently set up. So if you're, if you're competing rationally, um, you, you probably would, would you know, have, to, have to engage in this type of stuff. And so we, we, we went very public with it, and we started implementing it in, in uh, client-side infrastructure. But at the same time, for us, it's important to emphasize three things, right? Firstly, we don't run parameters which would expose anybody to access risk, either the network or clients. Secondly, we uh, frequently publish our, our research, and we try to go about this whole thing in a transparent manner. And then thirdly, liquid staking services, like LIDO would be the first that comes to mind, to us is neutral infrastructure. So this is not a place where, where we would ever um, engage in this type of latency optimization. Um, Let's set the stage here. Our pilot basically employed different setups for, for different relays. Um, just in practice, I think I alluded to it earlier, the way you play time in games is you call the get header request a little bit later, right? So if in, in your slot as a validator, you would have to tell the relay that, that you want to receive a block now. Um, that's a so-called get header request. You would call it a bit later. Um, our Dajo setup speaks to several relays, and we put them into different buckets. There's the benchmark setup, which is a relay for which we don't uh, run a, a, a latency parameter at all. There is the aggressive setup, which is a relay for which we delay the get header request as much as reasonable possible on a risk adjusted basis. So not as high as the theoretical expectation of 950 milliseconds, but slightly be below that with a, with a risk margin, still rather aggressive. And then there is what we christened the normal setup, and that's basically a, a latency parameter which, which is a bit uh, below the, the aggressive setup. Okay, and the moderate setup, that's just then again another, another step below that and, and super conservative. Um, in the box plot here, you can see what, um, what, what that looks like. If you look at the, the right side of the box plot, you, you kind of see what Adagio started to do after we uh, implemented our, um, our uh, parameters. And let's consolidate that into one graph. And what you see here is how the, how the network usually uh, would solicit get headers in expectations. So that's a box plot with a, with, with a rather uh, large margin around it. And then what Adagio would do. And if I had to put that into words, I would say that Adagio uh, calls get header a little bit later. But it does it in a manner which is, which is very risk aware. So the spread of that is, is rather small, right? So if you play time in games, I think it's very important to, to, to go about it in, in a manner which, which, is, uh, which is very consistent and with it, which is risk adjusted. And, and uh, you know, in, in quantitative terms, you would say that you want to reduce, reduce your variance there. And I think we did that uh, quite successfully. Um, Let's look at how this practical type setup compared to what we would have expected in uh, the theoretical part of our study, which again is a latency parameter of 950 milliseconds. So these graphs are quite closely clustered together. You might not be able to see it from the audience or on the stream, 
But basically what happens is that Adagio actually did slightly better than what, what we would have expected in, in theory. And so let's conclude by, by putting a number on it. Um, the, the network distribution of payloads basically is a mean of 0 0.0467 ETH per slot. Um, you, can see, you can see the quantiles below here. I'm not going to read it out, but of course there's a, there's a fair amount of, of variance. And the, the Adagio payloads have a medium which is a median which is quite significantly above that, right? Um, again, I, I mentioned variance, so uh, you know this is a, is a data set which is of a reasonable size, but it's not something that we've been running on uh, for, for years. Um, I think the upshot here is just that you know it, it, it is something which has affected our bottom line um, meaningfully, and I think the yeah, uh, so despite remaining below the 950 milliseconds, which we, which we uh, you know, quantified the theoretical expectation with, um, Adagio outperformed, uh, outperformed uh, the, the amount of revenue which, which we would have expected. Um, so let's, let's conclude here by providing a quick outlook. Um, there's a couple of reasons why, why Adagio did better than what we would have expected in theory. And we, we do have a lot of data, so um, we are looking at, at rolling out Adagio 2.0 now. And for Adagio 2.0, we, we would be making some of these, uh, some of these dynamics uh, more explicit, um, which, uh, which you know, kind of helped us outperform the theoretical expectation there. I, I think uh, the first insight is um, that you know, the, the usual way timing games are described is you basically have a latency parameter. And this is what in the, you know, kind of in our context there, taking a step further, is, is, is described as naive parameter-based optimization. Um, uh, what, 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 we, what we acknowledge there is that the MEV boost auction is not consistently timed. So Adagio 2.0 dynamically adjusts for, for divergences, right? And, and the fact that it's not consistently timed is, is definitely a reason why we outperformed the theoretical expectation. And we, we, we kind of found an approach which, which we think allows us to, to adjust for this on, on the fly and, and, and do even better in, in this regard going forward. Um, secondly, we, as I mentioned, have a lot of data, and we noticed a small but significant performance difference by geo geolocation and by, by data center, right? So, so what you want to do here, of course, is uh, you, you want to run in, in, in spots which, which look uh, more attractive relative to, to other spots. And specifically in the, in the context of Adagio 2.0 and timing games, that means that uh, you know, it now optimizes for, for network latency in, in a few ways. And what I mentioned at the beginning of the talk is you know, that we are, we are committed to being very transparent about that to, to kind of you know, balance, balance alignment with, with, uh, with competition. So expect, expect, uh, expect news, expect us to, to publish uh, you know, more, more specific uh, uh, takeaways uh, one, once we feel the, the statistics are in a good place that you know, makes, us, makes us reasonably confident in, in what we are theorizing here. And, and then the, the last point I want to make is some of the learnings that, that we have had on Ethereum. Um, so for example, I would highlight the last point here in terms of uh, network latency optimization. They might also carry over to other networks. So, so again, it's quite early days and I don't want to say anything that, that doesn't seem statistically certain. Um, but we've looked into some other networks and, and we think there are definitely takeaways that, that would not only work in an Ethereum context, but, but maybe on, on other chains as well. Um, yeah, and I, uh, that's, that's it. The outlook kind of concludes the presentation. Uh, we've published all of this on Reef Research. It, it was really important for us to make sure that people are aware of these, of these externalities and, and kind of to to trigger a discussion there. Um, so if you're interested in that, feel free to, to scan the QR code. Um, this presentation is also on our website, and I think we are, we are tweeting it as well. So you know, if, you, if you don't want to scan it now, feel, feel free to, to catch up with that later. Um, join the discussion. If anything here sounded interesting or relevant, feel free to, to find me after the presentation. And, and that's it. So have a, have a good conference, everybody.